In the first part of our video, we had discussed about the structure of tuberculosis, the etiology, the risk factors, and the pathogenesis of tuberculosis. Whereas in this video, we'll be discussing about namely the clinical features, the morphology, and a note on the laboratory diagnosis and algorithm for detecting tuberculosis. So let's begin with the clinical features. So there are two types that is involved depending upon the site that is involved. There, there is the pulmonary TB and the extra pulmonary TB. Now the pulmonary TB again could be, it could be a primary tuberculosis or it could be a secondary tuberculosis. So let's start with the discussion of the primary tuberculosis. So primary tuberculosis, what does it mean? It means that the infection is occurring for the first time in an unsensitized individual. That is, we could say that the infection is happening for the first time. That's what we call the primary tuberculosis. Now, the lung is involved and the characteristic lesion that we see is known as the gone focus. It's an important term. Gone focus is seen in primary TB. And where is the gone focus seen? The gone focus is actually seen in this region. So suppose that this is our lung. If this is our lung, we know that this would be our upper pole and this would be our lower pole. The gone lesions are characteristically seen on the lower part of upper lobe and the upper part of lower row. So this is a region where the gone focus is seen. Now, how do they appear? They appear as a grayish white mass or a grayish white patch and the size is around 1.5 centimeter. And the fate of this gone focus is that usually in most of the cases, this gone focus undergoes healing and fibrosis. And sometimes what happens is that calcium deposition occur and it undergoes calcification. When calcification occurs on gone focus after it is healed, it is known as rank A complex. Now in the primary pulmonary TB, along with the gone focus on the lung, there will be involvement of uh, the regional lymph nodes. So the lymph nodes surrounding the lungs will also be involved. So we can say that there would be a regional lymph node lymphadenitis or the inflammation of lymph nodes as well. Now this combination, this combination of gone complex plus the regional lymph adenitis that is what is known as the gone complex so gone complex are lesions that are seen in the primary pulmonary tb now how do they microscopically appear well we had discussed about it in our previous video so here we'll see the caseous granulomatous formation which is seen as a result of the type 4 hypersensitivity reaction so caseous granuloma will be formed and this caseous granuloma of the tuberculosis is by, known by the name tubercle so there will be a central region of caseating necrosis surrounded by epithelioid cells, which is further surrounded by a rim of lymphocytes. It's discussed in the previous video when we spoke about pathogenesis. So that's what we need to know about the primary TB. Now let's move on to the secondary tuberculosis. So as the term suggests, the secondary tuberculosis means that when a person got a primary TB and it healed, and when the infection reappears after some time, so we can say that, so it is developed in a sensitized individual that is what we call as a secondary tuberculosis. And it is usually in secondary tuberculosis where pulmonary and extra pulmonary manifestations are more seen. Now, here we'll be discussing about the pulmonary manifestation. So the secondary TB, what happens to it is that compared to the primary TB, three fate may occur to it. When it happens, the first one is it may heal just like the primary TB. Otherwise, it may progress to progressive pulmonary TB. So there would be a progressive pulmonary TB where there will, there will be active lesion which will erode the bronchi and the blood vessels or otherwise what happens is that it will even uh, spread, it will spread to the surrounding regions, spread to the bronchus. So there will be endobronchial spread. It could spread to the trachea. So there will be endotracheal TB. It could spread to the larynx. So there would be a laryngeal TB and so on. And then what could happen is that the tubercle basally will spread through the lymphatics from the lung. It will enter into the, uh, these lymph vessels will drain into the veins of our body and through the veins, it could re-enter into the lung. And that time, the TB that is formed is known by the name of miliary tuberculosis. So it's a very active disseminated TB. And in miliary TB, there will be lesions which resemble the millet seeds. That is why it got its name. So there are going to be small, multiple lesions which resemble the millet seeds. So that's the manifestations of tuberculosis uh, the, in the pulmonary when it happens for the second time. Now, what are the differences when compared to the primary tuberculosis? There is a difference in the site. That is, when we spoke about the gone focus, we said that it occurs in this region, right? That is the junction between the upper and lower lobes. Whereas 
the secondary tuberculosis usually affects the epical part and compared to that the compared to the primary and compared to the gone focus the regional lymph involvement is lesser so there is lesser lymph node involvement compared to primary pulmonary tuberculosis so that's about pulmonary tuberculosis now let's move to the extra pulmonary manifestations so through the lymphatics and through the blood vessels the secondary tb could spread to several organs in our body so it could spread to the lymph nodes leading to lymph adenitis and this is more actively seen in hiv patients active lymphadenitis it could spread to almost all the systems in our body so it could spread to the meninges leading to tubercular meningitis it could spread to the intestine and this was earlier seen intestinal tb and this is usually due to the consumption of unpasteurized milk the agent is actually myco my uh, mycobacterium bovis which is seen in the cow's milk uh, and where during earlier times pasteurization was not done so during the consumption of cow's milk the mycobacterium bovis will enter the intestine and cause intestinal tb again there are several other lesions when the kidney is affected there could be renal tb when the bones are affected there is a characteristic disease known as pots disease and it could also affect our genital organs such as the fallopian tube it could affect the epididymis and so on so there is a systemic involvement is possible in secondary pulmonary tuberculosis now moving on to the lab diagnosis how do we diagnose tb so for that we have the investigations and then we have the suspicious clinical features suggestive of tb to begin with the clinical features the main features that the patient will present are one is a low grade fever for more than 2 weeks so there are there will be low grade fever and the characteristic of this fever is that this fever will be accompanied by night sweats there will be sweating during night time and there will be an evening rise of temperature so that's a pattern that is seen in the patients that is during the evening they will start to feel an increase in temperature and during the night time they will be sweating and this will be continuing for more, at least for a duration of 2 weeks and along with that the patient will uh, have a weight loss and there will be the general symptoms associated uh, with infections such as malaise anorexia there will be difficulty uh, you know a lack of disinterest to eat food and then the other symptoms which could be present are one is hemoptysis might be seen when the bronchi or the blood vessels are eroded of the lungs that could lead to hemoptysis and there will be sputum production is that is seen in tb these are all associated with respiratory tract or pulmonary tb if pleural effusion occurs that could lead to a pleuritic type of chest pain so pleuritic pain might be heard so these are the uh, clinical features now let's move on to the investigation side so the first step in investigation is the collection of sample right so the sample that we usually collect is for the pulmonary tb obviously the sample is going to be sputum whereas for the extra pulmonary tb the depending upon the site there will be different uh, we'll collect different specimens such as the cs of the swabs urine stool gastric lavage and other specimens depending upon the site now for the sputum let's discuss about the sputum sample collection there are two collections will be two samples will be taken the first one is a sport sample sport sputum sample and then the next day after the sputum sample is taken when the patient comes to the doctor a sputum sample will be taken on the spot and then after the that day the patient goes back home and the next day on early morning another sample is taken so early morning sample is taken where the patient is advised to inhale deeply and then cough out the sputum during exhalation into a container so these are the two samples that are taken and after the samples are collected they are digested decontaminated and concentrated so this is done to liquefy the thick pus and increase the concentration and for this we use 4% sodium hydroxide so using so 4% sodium hydroxide we digest it and then we centrifuge it uh, thereby decontaminating and concentrating our sputum and after that we send the sputum sample for our investigations there are three types of investigations or uh, so there are three modalities of investigation first is the direct microscopy and for microscopy we do the afp staining afp staining is done and in afp staining we have to we'll see acid fast red colored slender bacilli this is the finding which is seen in the afp stained and there is also another kind of staining which is known as a fluorescent staining that is oramin staining the microbacterium tuberculin bacilli will be having a brilliant yellow color so there will be a brilliant yellow bacilli 
will be seen now coming to the culture methods so culture methods are actually the gold standard method so that is the first thing we need to know the gold standard is culture if you diagnose by culture it's a confirmed diagnosis of tuberculosis whereas microscopy will only give you a presentive diagnosis you cannot confirm you cannot say 100 percent that this is tb whereas in culture once you get the desired finding it means the person has a microbiologically confirmed tuberculosis so there are two methods there is a culture methods could either be the traditional or conventional method or we have the automated method so automated and convention methods now the conventional method is the lj medium that is the lowenstein jensen medium and in lj medium we have the characteristic description that is it is described as rough tough and buff colored colonies so this is a characteristic description of the colonies and for automated we have the mycobacterium growth indicator tube that is a mycobacterium growth indicator tube and when the mycobacterium growth occurs what we'll see is fluorescence will be seen fluorescence will be seen if the growth of mycobacterium tubercle occurs so that's how you identify from culture and nowadays we have the molecular methods and there are two important methods the first one is the cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test cbnat cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test and second thing that we have is a line probe assay these are the two molecular methods now what is important thing or uh, what is the important quality of these methods the first one is the cbnat in addition to identifying the mycobacterium tuberculosis it can also identify resistance to rifampicin so rifampicin is one of the drugs which are used in the treatment of it's one of the first line drugs the problem with tb is that it is highly resistant to drugs so drug resistance can occur very easily and that's one of the uh, main problems with tuberculosis so it's important to identify drug resistant before we start the management now cbnat will identify the resistance to rifampicin which is one of the first line drugs and the line probe assay it will actually identify resistance to almost all the drugs so it finds resistance to both first and second line drugs resistance is identified by line probe assay that is the advantage of these molecular methods so we have all these methods right now to diagnose we need an algorithm let's say a presumptive tb patient comes to us the patient is having symptoms suggestive of tuberculosis what do we do first two things are done the first one is we do a smear microscopy using the afb staining is done along with that we take a chest x-ray so chest x-ray is done and then there are a few possibilities right there are a few possibilities right the first one is the smear is positive if the smear is positive then that means confirmed that means then there is no further investigation is needed if you have acid phase bacilli in the smear then we say that it's a microbiologically confirmed tuberculosis we won't do further investigations we are not going to wait for culture we are going to start the treatment now what if it was negative so the smear microscopy could be negative but at the same time the chest x-ray could be positive so this combination where the chest x-ray is suggestive of tb whereas smear microscope is is negative in that condition what we do is we move for the nuclei the molecular method that is cbnat cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test is done and what if both are negative so let's take this scenario where we have a negative chest x-ray and we have a negative smear now one will obviously say that the person does not have tb right but actually that's not what we should do because we still have the patient still has clinical features suggestive of tb so he might be in a very early stage where there are no findings in x-ray or in the smear uh, or in the smear microscopy but he may still have a very minute infection which could progress so we should not leave the patients like that we should instead send him to nucleic acid amplification test so cbnat should be performed and in the cbnat again we'll have two findings right either it's going to be positive that is the microbacterium tuberculosis is detected or it could be negative right where still you do not find microbacterium tuberculosis so in this case what happens if it is negative first let's discuss about it now if it is negative still we will not leave the patient as such we'll ask ourselves this question whether is this patient really having a high clinical suspicion so are the clinical features really suggestive of tb despite all of this negativity you'll have to ask that question if the answer is yes then what we do is even though these investigations come out negative we'll still we are still suspicious right so we can't leave that patient as such so there might be a very minute uh, infection 
inside the body which cannot be detected by investigations so in that case we will say that the patient is clinically diagnosed tb it's an important distinction he is not microbiologically confirmed he is just clinically diagnosed as tb now what if the clinical suspicion is not there so all the findings are negative in that case we have to check for an alternate diagnosis it's not going to be the patient is not going to have tb in that case we'll go for alternate diagnosis now what if the cv net was positive so that cv net positive means you have detected the microbacterium tuberculosis right now you know one thing for sure that is again this person has been microbiologically confirmed as a tb so you have detected the microbacterium tuberculosis so is a microbiologically confirmed tb however now you have to start thinking about the management right when we move to the management when we spoke about cb net we said that cb net can identify rifampicin sensitivity so that's an important feature of cb net so we look for rifampicin resistance in cb net and the patient could be either rifampicin sensitive that is he is sensitive to rifampicin or he is resistant to rifampicin now with the knowledge of sensitivity and resistance we'll start with the appropriate management so we'll start with the first line uh, anti tubercular drugs if he is sensitive and if he is resistant then that's a separate topic that is how do you manage a rifampicin refis, uh, resistant tb uh, so uh, that's not discussed in this video will anyway let us know that for now we'll manage the rifampicin resistant tb what we need to know is that by now by cb net we will have microbiologically confirmed tuberculosis now there are two more points here we have discussed about sputum right and sputum is actually a pulmonary manifestation of a pulmonary tb the patient could have extra pulmonary tb right he may not have pulmonary tb in that case what can be done so we know we said that depending upon the site different uh, specimens are collected whatever specimen you collect in an extra pulmonary tb you directly do the cb net so you directly do the cb net and it either comes out positive or it comes out negative if it is negative you will again ask is the clinical suspicion high if it is yes he is clinically diagnosed as tb if it's no you check for alternate diagnosis and if it's positive then you diagnose uh, it's a microbiologically confirmed case of tuberculosis again uh, another group is children and in children whether it is pediatric pulmonary tb or extra extra pulmonary tb you do not go for smear examination why because children's do not Uh, produce sputum they are not able to cuff out their sputum unless they are 5 uh, to 6 years so you will directly go for cb net and then the procedure is same as what we have discussed so far so that's about the diagnosis and the clinical features and also the morphological findings that you see in tb